Hello everyone, welcome to episode 4 of our Cricket Her Social Isolation vodcast. Um, we are yet again, through the magic of um, exciting technology, transformed into being somewhere other than where we are, which is at home. Um, so all guests is welcome. Uh, last week um, we talked a little bit about our predictions for wisdom. Um, and we are excited to say that we received our wisdom for 2020, <laughs> uh, which is great because we weren't expecting to get it for a while because of postal delays, but that's brilliant. Um, and um, so were our predictions right, Sid, that there would be a woman in the five cricketers of the year? Of course there was a woman in the five cricketers of the year. Um, and it was Elise Perry and it was very, very well deserved. Um, and not only did she win one of the five critics of the year, she also won another award, Raf. She did. She was this year's leading uh, female cricketer in the world. Um, so, yeah, so she's become the first woman to do the double. And I think you're absolutely right that it was very well deserved. Yeah, it's important to remember that the criteria for the two awards are actually quite different, mm -hmm. aren't they? The criteria for the for the five critics of the year. First of all, there's this sort of ancient historical rule that um, you can only win it once. So that obviously ruled out a load of the, for instance, the England players that won the Men's World Cup yeah. last summer because they'd already been they'd already year. been nominated. Yeah. Um, so the the five critics of the year is for performances across the English summer, basically. Um, whereas the leading cricketer in the world is for um, the performances throughout the world in the in the previous year mm -hmm. um, but Elise Perry excelled in, in both of those mm -hmm. didn't she in terms of the leading cricket of the year Raf um, you know you've um, written this award now for six times I believe um, this was one of the easier discussions you've had wasn't it about who should receive this award yeah so it's I mean it's a great privilege um, to have been originally asked to write this back when they first did it, which I think was 2013, um, to now. So I, I don't take that for granted. It's definitely a privilege. Um, and the way it's done is that um, Lawrence Booth, the editor, sends me an email um, and basically says, who do you think are the leading candidates for this year's award? Um, and I guess um, I, I believe that he also consults other people who are kind of seen to be knowledgeable about the women's game. Uh, but obviously, as editor, it's ultimately his decision who is who wins the award every year. Um, so that's the way it works. Uh, and normally I kind of would suggest maybe two or three candidates for the award and would say that these are the people who I think might be um, kind of, you know, leading candidates. Um, and uh, these are the reasons. Um, but you're right that this year it was uh, it was quite an easy call, basically. I mean, um, Elise Perry just uh, excels at everything at the moment. Um, the only thing that was going to prevent her from excelling um, for the coming three months was obviously her injury that she's that she's recently sustained. Um, but obviously, um, in some ways, that's come at a good time, um, as much as injuries ever can, given that we're not likely to see any cricket for the next few months. Um, but that's by the by. This was obviously for performances last year, of which I guess the, the big one as far as we were concerned, was that bowling performance at Canterbury when she absolutely ripped through England. Yeah, we were reviewing the video that um, we made before that game and we yeah. were saying, oh, England have a chance to get back into things here. Um, but, you know, at least Perry really ended their Ashes hopes that, that day with such a devastating performance. Um, and, you know, it was one of the all-time great performances. It was it was a performance almost akin to Harman Preet's performance in the World Cup semi-final in 2017 in that, you know, it... It just kind of transcended the the transcended the game, and she was just on a le another level to everyone on the field. And my overriding memory of that day is, um, you know, a shell shocked Mark Robinson coming over to do the the press conference, which we just did on the outfield there at Kent. And um, you know, he just felt that he had to spend the whole of the press conference defending his players and saying, "Look, we're really not that bad." I think that you know, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. It, it you know, that was and that was the kind of it, it was all a bit. Um, it was very, very defensive. And then, you know, he finished the press conference and he walked away. And then a couple of minutes later, he rushed back over. And um, he said, look, guys, um, I, don't, I don't want you to quite print that. I want, I want you to, to say what's, what's true is that, you know, that was just a miracle performance from Elise and she's yeah. such a great player. And, um, you know, the, it was her performance that won this match for Australia. And that's, that's what, what's important, right about Elise Perry's performance. 
and everyone did and why not yeah that's mark robinson to a t isn't it um honest generous with his time anyway um yeah no it was i was just thinking that actually um when we were re-watching the video that we made beforehand we literally had no idea about what was coming and that that must be true of many of the great cricketing performances you know say in the men's game Headley Verity taking 10 for 10 or whatever um you just you wouldn't have known when you were going to the ground that day that that was what you were going to see before your eyes and it's yeah, that, that was a little before even my time right <laughs> Okay, but I'm a historian. I'm allowed to talk about the past. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and in that video we were saying, oh, England are just, you know, two or three notches away from a good performance, weren't we? Um, and watching it back, we just looked incredibly naive, but we had no idea what we were about to witness. Yeah, well, Elise Perry was two or three hundred notches above everybody else. A fantastic performance, and, you know, the, the kind of the that's the standout performance, but it wasn't just that. It was everything that she's done mm. over the past year. So congratulations to Elise Perry. Absolutely. Okay, so the other thing, or one of the other things that's happened this week was we were able to publish a piece um, with news about the um, new Centres of Excellence, um, which we'd hinted at la in our last podcast that we were going to be able to publish some news this week. Um, so we'd spoken to various people about this um, and just needed to get kind of final sign off on the on the piece. Um, so what was the kind of gist of that piece about the Centres of Excellence, Sid? Well, the gist of it is, I mean, unsurprisingly nothing's really happening at the moment um you know everybody's focused um on you know dealing with more immediate problems of the of the coronavirus and trying to work out you know how they can play any cricket mm -hmm. at all this season and you know that remains everybody's focus um i think that you know it's also obvious that even regardless of the of the current situation that they probably wouldn't be quite where they hoped they would be but you know if it was a normal season then they would certainly would be a bit further but at the moment basically nothing's happening um you know they still remain hopeful that they can um get stuff happening this summer as the whole of the english game remains hopeful mm -hmm. and I, I believe we're going to find out some more stuff this week and that the ecb have accepted they're going to have to start taking some decisions quite soon haven't they? that's what we're hearing so that we might see some decisions this week or next week um which you know put a bit more kind of concrete around what is actually they accept is going to be possible mm -hmm. and not possible yeah, so in terms of the centres of excellence, where we are at the moment is they've got the regional directors of women's cricket in place. Um, I think there were there are six out of eight of them who are confirmed and then the last couple will be confirmed shortly. Um, so they have got that first big step in place. But what was the, going to be the next step was, um, first of all, recruiting the, the rest of the staff members, so the rest of the coaching and the support staff around that, um, who are going to be tied to those centres all year round. Um, so those are full-time posts. And then um, also the, the player selection process was going to be starting round about now. And both of those yeah. things have basically been put on indefinite hold. Yeah, and that's obviously very unfortunate for some of the players who you know, were hoping, you know, um, I, I guess that no player should have, was, was totally assured of a place, mm -hmm. but we know um, from talking to people that there were people that have been basically told, you know, you've got a place, you, you'll have a a full-time job in cricket from uh, the beginning of this season yeah and those players haven't got that full-time job so you know that's really unfortunate for mm. them and it means that you know they're still in a position where they're having to you know find other means of earning money until that comes around um you know and again we're hopeful that it can still come around this summer the ecb have promised us that they're you know that the investments they talked about are secure so that's money still going to yeah, going to come in and be really available. That's really good news, isn't it? Because um, there'd been these rumors that and I'd certainly said in the previous podcast that I was worried for that 20 million pound investment that that was going to be the first thing on the table when cuts started to have to be made. But actually the ECB have said no, that investment's really important for our future strategy and it's staying in place, which is so that's really good. Yeah. Anyway, we'll you know we'll we'll carry on bringing you the news that we have it. I think. Yeah. I th so one other thing um, that's likely to be announced soon um, is first of all the um, the actual uh, hosts for the regional centres of excellence. We haven't had those confirmed yet. So um, when they announced this new big strategy. 
uh, last October, I think it was, Claire Connor said, oh, you know, it's possible that, say, Loughborough University might end up being one of the regional hosts. And then potentially we'd also expect to see counties in there. So Hampshire, whoever else. Uh, Surrey, etc. Um, but we don't know. We don't know yet because those haven't been confirmed. So that is going to be confirmed shortly, I believe. Um, and the other thing is the names as well. So we know that the team for um, the uh, the Western team and the Western and Wales team is going to be the Western Storm because they put that in their job advert. Um, but I think some of the other regions have been a little bit more keeping it under the under their hat um, as to exactly what their what their new names are going to be. Um, but we've already speculated that we think it's quite likely that um we've certainly heard people talk about the southern vipers yeah um as a as a thing that will be still there next year for example so yeah so that's uh, i mean not been officially confirmed but probably will be soon so there will be a little bit more news leaking out hopefully over the next few weeks um or maybe not even leaking out maybe being officially announced who knows yeah, <laughs> um so that's where we are with the centers of excellence the other big piece that we published this week um, was by you, wasn't it, Sid, which was about um, the women's hundreds um, and the Australia players. Yeah, the situation in Australia is is kind of an interesting one. This is actually something that happened before we recorded the vodcast last week, but I hadn't really picked mm. up on it because it had been in the Australian you know, press and it was more of a sort of politics story, really, that nobody had picked up on the implications for it, which mm. was that um, Australians have essentially been banned from all international travel. And this is going to apply pretty much to all Australians. The Australian government have said that essentially there are no exceptions. I mean, obviously there will be, you know, exceptions for presumably the Australian Prime Minister to um, to be able to attend, you know, meetings at, you know, and people that from Australia that are involved in the World Health Organization, that kind of thing. But it really is that that's going to be it. The Australian government are saying, you know, that really the numbers of people that will be travelling will be tiny, and mm. the Australian government's official website essentially says don't even bother asking because you won't be allowed to travel. So Australian citizens, um, which um, include the England coach Lisa Kitely, um, and obviously all of the Australian players, are look like they are not going to be allowed to leave Australia under any circumstances for six months from the time of that announcement, which is uh, still pretty much six months away, which takes us through to October or so. Um, so that means the chances of any Australians, men or women, mm -hmm. playing in the 100, unless those players are already here, um, which some of them might be in the men's game potentially, don't know the answer to that, um, but none of the women are as far as we know because they were all in Australia um, at the end of the World 2020. Yeah. None of them are going to be able to come back. The couple of England players that we know are still in Australia are technically allowed to come back. Uh, so that's Lauren Winfield and Amy, Amy Jones. Jones. So they'll legally be allowed to travel because they're not Australian citizens. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know whether they'll actually be able to, in terms of you know whether there'll be flights that um, back for them, is again an, another unknown. It's a bit worrying for England, from England's perspective, that their coach Lisa Kitely has ended up ten thousand miles away. From yeah, the... I mean, not that anyone can the... practically do any training at the moment, but you just think that logistically that's going to be another headache to try and sort out whenever it is that cricket, or if cricket could resume this summer. Um, England aren't going to be able to train with their coach. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but you know that's the situation we're in, and we have to, you know, everyone has to make the best of that situation. Mm -hmm. I think there was something being uh, mooted on Twitter yesterday by Ian O'Brien, which is really interesting. Talking of making the best of situations, <laughs> uh, it's a really interesting suggestion. So. Um, New Zealand appear to have got the pandemic very well under control, much better than we have in the UK, certainly. Um, and they are talking about potentially even having eliminated the virus within the next few weeks. So Ian O'Brien was saying, well, could we have international cricket returning to, to New Zealand to take place in New Zealand, um, potentially with, say, teams being flown in from England or, or elsewhere and being quarantined for two weeks, doing training amongst themselves for that couple of weeks and then playing international fixtures in New Zealand. And at least, even if those fixtures had to be played indoors, at least that would be something for the TV companies to show. Yeah, now, indoor cricket, Raph, that's a bit of a blast from the past. <laughs> You're the resident historian. Talk to us about indoor cricket. Well, because indoor cricket has been a thing in this country, but is currently not something that you see very much of. No, I mean, it's very big, isn't it, still in Australia um, and uh, also closer to home. They play a lot of club cricket in, uh, or in indoor club cricket in, Aust in Australia, in Scotland. Right. Um, so the, the Scottish Cricket uh, Association uh, organise uh, a women's indoor league over the mm -hmm. winter, which has been quite a successful programme for them. Um, but it is something that used to happen in England, isn't it, as well? 
Yeah, no, it was really big. Um, so, oh, shall I give a plug for my book? <laughs> There's a little bit about um, indoor cricket in my history of uh, women's cricket because back in the uh, 80s particularly, it was quite big in England. Um, so the figure that I've got in there is there that there are about 45,000 people playing in 1987. Um, and it was particularly popular. That's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Um, so it was around about the time when um, they started to build lots of indoor sports centres, um, and so you'd have lots of sports going on, and you'd have, and they were really big, um, kind of in the mid to late eighties and and sort of the early nineties, and then those sports centres gradually fell into slight disrepair. Um, but you know, when they were first being built. There were lots of people who wouldn't necessarily have picked up a cricket bat otherwise, who weren't interested in playing kind of 11 aside outdoor cricket, who would just go along and have fun and for a bit of recreational cricket would go and go and play. So they were kind of picking up this massive additional population of um, of men and, and lots of women as well. Um, and one of the things about these sports centres was that, you know, they had creches attached to them. So if you were a mother, then you could go and leave your children there and you could go and play some indoor cricket for, say, an hour or a couple of hours. Hours and it was that kind of flexibility that you don't get so much in in the outdoor game um, and there were certainly some England players as well who were very big in indoor cricket so Jan Britton uh, represented England um, in both outdoor cricket okay. and indoor cricket um, and Jo Chamberlain who was another England player she she was actually a manager of one of these indoor cricket centres um, so there were people who were kind of quite high profile from an England cricket perspective who were very involved in indoor cricket. So it was definitely a big thing. So that's Raf's history lesson for the day. <laughs> OK, well, it's, it's something that, that, you know, obviously, you know, could happen. I mean, I, I, everybody's desperate to get um, cricket. Well, the, the sports administrators and the TV mm. people are desperate to get back, cricket back on TV. So if New Zealand can make that happen... Then good luck to them. We will we will cheer from social isolation here in in Wokingham. Yeah, we'd certainly be watching, wouldn't we? We've not got very much else to do. <laughs> okay, um, there was another um, interesting thing this week with um, was kind of I guess related to this um, sort of because it's about getting international cricket um, back happening. Um, here in England. So there was an interview with Ashley Giles, wasn't there, who's the director of men's cricket at the ECB. Uh, so he's sort of the equivalent to Claire Connor in the men's game. Uh, and he did an interview over Zoom, presumably. Um, and yeah, he was saying some stuff about the international sport. Yeah, so he was talking about, um, you know, in terms of how quickly you can get the players ready and mm -hmm. things. And he made some important points that, um, you know, will apply to the women's game just as much. He reckoned mm -hmm. it would take about a month after the isolation finishes to get players ready for international cricket um and you know that's in terms of like being able to you know get your fitness properly on board and get you actually back in the net you know facing balls and things one thing that's really important to remember is that you know all the players that are currently isolating and particularly the women are you know not isolating in you know palaces with their own their own cricket nets you know a lot of the women um you know live in flats and things so you know we've got senior members of the england team that just own a one bedroom flat or a two bedroom flat um and that's their you know that's, that's where they have to do their exercise and yeah. their training at the moment and they can yeah. go out they're, they're in exactly the same situation as everyone else in this country they can go out for one run a day um you know and that's really no substitute for um actually you know facing balls in a net uh, and actually you know running properly and running you know hard in like match conditions and things and these things are important just not in terms of your game performance but in terms of your health you know that you know if you come into facing balls in an international match yeah. um after not having faced anything you need to get back to the point where you're used to facing a cricket mm. ball again it's just it's just it's going to be just like coming back from injury mm. for every single player so it's important unfortunately to understand that it's not realistic to just go okay the lockdown's over now we can start cricket again it's the lockdown's over now we need a four-week period of the players being able to, you know, get back up to that level mm. of match fitness so they don't go walk into a match and horrendously injure themselves and, you know, put shoulders out and legs out and all sorts of other stuff. So I thought that was a really important point from, from Mr. Charles. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to be pessimistic, but I do think the chances of any international cricket happening this summer are, are still 
fairly low Somewhere on that basis. Um, I, I'm much more hopeful that we might be we might see some rec- some more of the recreational cricket happening. Um, so some of these kind of 50 over women's county championships um, that have been planned, or maybe even some of the centres of excellence could potentially get some fixtures up and running in September, um, sort of towards the back end of our season in England. That could happen. Um, I'm not ruling that out, but I think the international stuff is is much less likely, unfortunately. Uh, and that, that comment from Ashley Giles sort of confirmed that in our heads, didn't it, really? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. OK, well, um, just wanted to flag up one last thing um, before we go, which is we did put out a tweet about this as well. Um, but there's a new publication uh, that's coming out fortnightly at the moment called The Pinch Hitter. And it's by the or it's being put together by the same guys who um, do... Uh, Whistling Cricket Monthly magazine. Um, so Which I still keep wanting to call all out cricket. Sorry, <laughs> <No>. guys. <laughs> Um, so Tri North um, is the company, and they do various different publications. Um, and it's it's really great because they're trying to give opportunities for freelancers at a time of um, kind of you know when work otherwise might well be drying up for people because there's not any live cricket happening to write about. So. And it's important to recognise that quite a lot of the guys at Whistling, and in fact one of the guys here have given up their own salaries, part of their own salaries, in order to in order to fund this, in order to ensure that other people that are freelancers that don't have the regular income that, you know, we have, can continue to, you know, exist and make a living in, in these difficult times. So thanks to everyone that's been involved and go go ahead and download it. It's a pay what you want basis, so pay what you can afford, mm. download it and enjoy it. Yeah, and also they are after more women's cricket submissions. So if you are a freelance women's cricket writer anywhere in the world and you've got things to say, then do get in touch with them. Um, so you can pitch to pinch hitter at trinorth, which is T-R-I north.co.uk. Um, that's all for this week. Um, we'll see you in a week's time. Stay safe and well. <laughs>